Hope is a powerful word. Hope is a word that gives people courage, that motivates them, and helps them to advance and move forward in life. Unfortunately, in our society, the average person doesn't fully understand that meaning or the meaning of the word hope. They can't fully grasp or do not fully grasp the hope according to what the Bible teaches. What God teaches about hope and how the world understands the word hope to be is very different. It's not the same. The average person uses hope in such a casual or a general way, and they use it so frequently that the value or the importance of that word isn't fully appreciated. We say things like, I hope I'll pass my test. How many of you guys are in school? Can I see your hand? You guys have your exams coming up, midterms maybe? How many of you guys would like to pass your test or your exams? Okay. And you say things like, I hope I'll pass my exam. Uh, I hope my favorite sports team will make the playoffs, or I hope my team will win the championship. Now, for the Niner fans, this, you know, I'm not even going to go there anymore. <laughs> it's bittersweet. I'm a little salty not to be, you know. <laughs> we, we wish and we hope that our teams would do well. We say things like, I hope uh, my husband or my wife will get me that gift for Valentine's. And that's just a little reminder uh, to you who are married that Valentine's is just in a few days. But we say things like, I hope they'll get this for me. I hope that she'll buy this for me. I hope that I'll get this for my birthday. I hope that this is what I'll get for, an, uh, for my anniversary. I hope this is what I'll get. But you know, hope is much more than just wishful thinking. It's much more than just crossing our fingers or to this world knocking on wood and hoping for the best outcome. Even in serious situations, people say things like, I hope my surgery goes well. I hope the result comes back negative. I hope that I get that job or that promotion. I hope that they won't fire me. I hope that my relationship will be restored. I hope that my husband or my wife will forgive me. I hope that my children will, will, will live for God and, and, and do what's right. And we have all these hopeful wishes. But the word hope in the Bible goes beyond that. It's much deeper. And more importantly, hope always has a strong foundation in God. Now let me say this. As we think of the word hope, hope is defined as a confident and a certain expectation. To anticipate with pleasure and to have great peace and assurance. Hope means to strongly trust or to have faith in someone or something for a desired outcome. Now, before we get into our message and our outlines, I want to mention that hope is a major theme in the Apostle Peter's writing, especially here in 1 Peter. There's a lot of themes that you could read about. Uh, walking in holiness and living in holiness is a theme in the, uh, in the epistle of, uh, of the Apostle Peter. And by the way, let me just say this. Holy living still matters to God. Amen. And it doesn't matter how old or young you are, holy living is still important to God. And so that's one of the themes that we find in 1 Peter. Uh, there's a theme of spiritual growth and maturity. There's a theme regarding the word of God uh, defend, uh, being defended as preserved and, and, and being defended as God's word. Uh, there's, a, there's a theme that goes about Christian relationships with authority and even with marriage and uh, responsibilities within the church. And so 1 Peter has a lot of themes. But one of the major themes that we find in 1 Peter is this matter of hope. Uh, Dr. Or, uh, Edmund Hybert wrote this in his commentary of 1 Peter. He says, the first epistle of Peter has appropriately been called the epistle of living hope. It sets forth the hope of the believer in the midst of a hostile world, addressed to those who stood as strangers in the midst of an antagonistic and oppressive world. It is, ring it is a ringing appeal to a steadfast endurance and unswerving loyalty to Christ. Now that's important to understand because in verse number one, when it, me when it mentions Peter and the apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered, he's referring to the believers who were scattered uh, maybe from Jerusalem or in the neighboring cities there in Judea who had to go to different regions like Galatia and Bithynia and, and, and Asia and, and, and Cappadocia because they were being persecuted for their faith. These scattered believers were being threatened and uh, they were being uh, uh, put to jail and in prison. Some were losing their jobs, some were losing their houses and their lands, and some were even losing their lives or the lives of their loved ones. Back then, it was not easy being a Christian, but they still had to stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, I know maybe in your, in, in your school work or in your workplace and in our society, it may not be the easiest thing to promote yourself or to uh, tell other people that you're a Christian and to do what's right. But listen, we're still required to do so whether it's easy or not. 
Christianity is not defined by being, uh, you know, uh, uh, Christianity is not defined by convenience, but it's defined by our commitment to the Lord. And these believers who were committed to the Lord, they were being persecuted and they had to scatter abroad in different places. And, and Peter is writing to these uh, believers who were persecuted to give them some instruction and encouragement about their faith in the Lord. And in this setting, God uses the apostle Peter to write them a message of hope. Now, if you haven't noticed, our world needs hope. You and I need hope. Because it's easy to keep our eyes on the problems of this world. It's easy to look at the news and to watch the TV and the crimes escalating and all the different wars going on. And we see about you know, the devastation in different places with the earthquakes. And, and we get discouraged and uh, uh, we feel oppressed in our spirit. And we're wondering, when is this going to end? Where's the light at the end of the tunnel? And I want us to understand that God understands our concerns and God understands our worrying and our anxieties and God understands when we feel like there is no hope, but at the same time, God has already promised us in this word that there is hope. And that you and I can live a life full of it. God wants you and I to have this living hope. And so with that, I want to talk about three lessons of the hope of God and I'm going to use the first two to uh, really set a foundation and then more of an application at the end for believers. So are you following hand tight with me as we go about our message? Number one, I want to start off with the source of our hope. Going back to verse number two to verse number three and, uh, uh, of our passage, let's talk about the source of our hope. Uh, our source of hope in verse number two, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit and to obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively or a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead now I love being a dad God has blessed Kat and I with two wonderful yet crazy kids uh, Kai is turning five next month and he's already wondering what he's gonna get for his birthday I think he's really hoping that he'll get to go to a Warriors game. <laughs> I mean, I love being able to just see my children grow and Kai and Layla and how God's working in their life. And, you know, Kat and I are very careful to just try to teach Kai and try to teach Layla, especially with Kai in this age and he's just absorbing all the knowledge around him. Uh, we're, we're trying to help him understand the importance of God and family. Hopefully, if you ask Kai, and we've, we've been training and teaching him this, that if you ask him, Kai, what's the most important thing in life, that he'll say, God and family. Now, not all of you guys go one, 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 you know, all together once at him and just, you know, give him an oral <laughs> uh, interrogation of what he believes, okay? He's not, you know, he's still growing. But if you ask him, hopefully he'll say, God and family. And we teach him that because what we want to understand is that Things in this life, trends and material things, they're, they're going to pass and go away. They're going to come and they're going to go. But what, what, when you put your faith in God and when you keep loving your family, that stays forever. But the thing is, I don't just want him to repeat a phrase and say, God and family, God and family, God and family. I want him to understand. And so I would ask him things like, all right, Kai, if you were to have a day with just dad or a day playing just with all your toys, which one would you rather have? And to my surprise, I asked him recently, he said, dad. And man, that like melted my heart. I was like, yes. And then like I turned around and I was like, man, praise the Lord. And I thought, like, good answer, good answer, Kai. And then I asked him why. And then he goes, well, without dad, I won't have any toys. <laughs> And it's not just because we buy him the toys or we give him the toys that he wants. It, it, when he gets presents for his birthday or Christmas or uh, sometimes we celebrate half-year birthdays, kind of stuff like that, cat, cat likes that. And so oftentimes he'll get toys from other people and he'll get to open the presents and get to unwrap them and, and see what they are. But we don't let him play with it all at once. And you're like, Brother Irwin, that's, that's too strict. <laughs> well, we don't want him to just 
get used to all the toys at once and not appreciate each one of them, you know, in a very meaningful way. And so we would sort of separate. And so just like just uh, this past th uh, Thursday, he got to use his scooter that he got for Christmas for the very first time. And he loved it, enjoyed it. But he's understanding that it goes beyond just toys, the food that's on his table, the clothes that he wears, uh, the place that we live in, all of that is from mom and dad. And it begins to be easily translated when we begin to teach him that in life, God is the source of all blessings. That salvation comes from God. That life is from God. And so we're teaching him that if you are to pursue anything, don't just go to the surface of the blessings. You got to go to the source. You got to go to the source. And it's the same thing with hope. You see, people... Uh, uh, exercise hope all the time. The problem with hope with, with regards to the world and in regards to people is not that they don't have the ability to exercise hope or the ability to believe and have faith on something. The problem is that their hope is settled on the wrong thing. Their hope is not found in the source where God wants it to be. And I want to make mention of that this morning, that our source of hope, according to chapter number 1, verse number 3, uh, this living, lively hope is through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Brothers and sisters in Christ, and if you're visiting here this morning, I want us to all remember and to all note that the source of hope that comes from God is found in the person of Jesus Christ. There is no other source outside of Jesus Christ. And so we see that the source of God's hope is found in His Son, the Lord Jesus. We see letter A, Jesus and His person revealed who He is. Now, if you study your Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you'll quickly understand, or you should at least understand that Jesus is God. Jesus was not just a man. Jesus was not just a good teacher or somebody who wanted to revolt out of a Roman oppression. Jesus was much more than just a good man or a good person or a good teacher. Jesus is God. Colossians chapter 2 verse 9, the Bible says, For in him, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, in Jesus dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus is just as much God as God the Father, and Jesus is just as much God as the Holy Spirit. Jesus is God. Uh, Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels preaching to the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Now, I, I, want, I want to encourage and, and to just challenge every believer in this room to know why you believe Jesus is God. Amen. To understand from the scriptures where it teaches us that Jesus Christ is God. Not just to repeat what our pastor says or what your Sunday school teacher says, but to dig in God's word and to find evidence in scripture to prove that Jesus Christ is God. The Bible teaches us that Jesus is eternal. Uh, Jesus is God because he's omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. Uh, Jesus is God because he has the power to create. He has the power to heal sicknesses, the power to forgive sins. Jesus is God because he has the power to raise the lame, to open the eyes of the blind, to loosen the tongues of the mute, to reverse the disease in blood, to give life to a lifeless body. Jesus is God. Uh, Jesus is God because he has the power over demons, the power over nature, and the power over death. We see time and time again in scriptures that Jesus is God. Study your Bible. Jesus is God. He's Alpha and Omega, the first and the last who always was, always was, always is, and always will be. He's the God who spoke the world into existence. He's the God who walked with Adam in the garden. Uh, he is God who wrestled with Jacob. He is God who stood in front of Joshua and claimed to be the captain of the Lord. He is God who is holy, harmless, separated from sinners, undefiled. The Bible says without guile and without sin, Jesus Christ is God. He's the source of our hope because he's God. But not only do we see Jesus and his person revealed, we see Jesus and his promise reassured. If you study the Gospels, Jesus Christ throughout each Gospel gave a promise and a reassurance that he would live again after his death. He promised that he was going to be crucified and taken away, and after that he was to be killed but yet on the third day, he would rise from the dead. Matthew chapter, two, uh, chapter 20, verse number 17 to 19, teaches us that Jesus going up to Jerusalem took the 12 disciples apart in the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him, the Bible teaches. But yet the Bible teaches us that he gave a promise that on the third day, he shall rise again. He promises. 
He gave promise that he would live and be uh, live again and would resurrect from the dead. He even told Martha in John chapter number 11 that he has power over life and death. The Bible says in John chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. He gave promise to his disciples and to those that followed him about his ability and his power to overcome death. Now you say, why is that important? It's important because what Jesus says will come to pass. God's word is true, amen? God's word is, God, God's word is settled and God's word is, is complete. God's word, whatever he says, he will do. And the Bible teaches us that his word is true and faithful. And it will endure for thousands of generations. Our God is a promise keeper. And you can trust him. And that's important because when you place your hope on a doctor or when you place your hope on a spouse or when you place your hope in this world or politicians, they're going to let you down with their words. They're going to promise one thing, but they're, under gonna, they're, they're, they're not going to perform to its full promise. They're not going to keep their word. But that's not how Jesus Christ is. Jesus Christ keeps his word, and when, whenever he reassures us with a promise, we can have full confidence and full hope that his word will come to pass and will be true. He promised that he will live again, and that leads us to let us see Jesus and his powerful resurrection. Our, our source of hope is in Jesus Christ because he is God. Our source of hope is in Jesus Christ because he's a promise keeper. He reassures us with his word. But then also we find that he is the source of our hope because he rose from the dead, his powerful resurrection. That's why we worship on Sunday. Because it was on the first day of the week that the Lord rose from the dead. Our hope ultimately rests on the fact that Jesus is alive. We serve a risen Savior. The Buddhist faith can't say that. Those who are Islam can't say that. Jehovah's Witnesses can't say that about Joseph Smith. But we as believers and as Christians, we can say that our Savior lives. He's not in the tomb. He's not in a cross. Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Our Savior is alive. He lives. See, after Jesus was brutally beaten and was horrifically crucified, the Bible says that he gave up the ghost. He died and his soul and his spirit separated from his body. Jesus literally died on the cross and for three days his body laid in a borrowed tomb. But on that third day, on that third day, when the sun rose up that morning, the Bible says that the body of Christ was raised up by the power of the Holy Spirit. We serve a living Savior. The women saw Jesus alive. The disciples saw Jesus alive. His, brothers who, uh, his brother who didn't believe in him saw him alive for 40 days. The Bible teaches us after his resurrection, he showed himself alive uh, with many infallible proofs. Acts chapter 1 verse 3. Bible even tells us that he showed himself alive to a group of 500 people at once. Jesus Christ is alive. You're not worshiping a dead God. You're not worshiping somebody who doesn't understand your feelings. You're not worshiping somebody who doesn't see with his eyes, who doesn't hear with their ears. Uh, Jesus Christ is our great high priest. He's alive and he's working in our lives today. That's why Paul was so adamant about defending the resurrection of Jesus. By the way, if you study the book of Acts, you know what was their driving motive for preaching the gospel? It was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why they were so, they were so bold in their witness. They were so risky and willing, and, and willing to preach in different places. You know why? Because they were willing to put their life on the line for the truth that Jesus Christ is alive. And Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then, Christ, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. If Jesus Christ didn't, re didn't resurrect, we should just close our church up. Basically is what Paul is saying. He says, your faith is also in vain if Jesus didn't rise. Yea, and if we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up to Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, uh, then, is not uh, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain or empty. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But I'm glad the verse doesn't stop there, amen. He says, but now, 
But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came, the, uh, came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. This living hope that we have is found in the resurrected Savior. Listen, teenagers, if you are going to get excited about something, get excited about the living Savior of Jesus Christ, amen. Uh, you can get excited in this life about so many things. You can get excited about your vacations, about your, about, about your stock market, uh, about your investments, about the things that you own. But listen, as a believer, there's nothing more exciting uh, for us than to know that our Savior lives. Jesus is our hope, our solid rock because he's alive. Which then leads me to... Secondly, our security in heaven. So going back to chapter number one of our passage, he says, and again, uh, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away. And then he says, reserved in heaven for you. I think we can all agree that security is important. When you're driving, you want to be secured with your seatbelt. How many of you guys like roller coasters? Can I see your hand? How many of you guys are afraid of roller coasters? How many of you guys would still go even if you're afraid? <laughs> you know, if you're going to go on a uh, roller coaster, I think my, one of uh, my favorite rides has to be the one that uh, Six Flags down in SoCal, uh, Goliath. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? And we always want to see, me and my friends, when we went there, I think it was at a youth conference, we went there for Six Flags, and I remember we waited a long time just to get to the front row. And then we got buckled in, we got into our cart, and then the first thing that we got to check is, is my seatbelt on? <laughs> and I always mess around with the person sitting beside me. I think, hey, I think your belt is loose. I think that bar is loose. And they're going to start panicking. Oh, no, no, no. Hey, stop this ride. Stop this ride. Why? Because you don't want to go up on that ride not knowing if your seatbelt or that security bar is fastened correctly. We want to be secure. We invest in security systems for our homes and our properties and our cars. We want to keep our confident information secured and safe. We want our financial assets and our investments to be secured. We, we enjoy and we appreciate when we know and have certainty that things are secured. But more than just having security on earth, we must learn that what God, what God wants for us is that we, uh, that what God wants us for us is that we have eternal security and that our home is in heaven someday. The Bible teaches us about two eternal experiences that occurs after death. There is eternal life, which is permanent relationship with God. And then there's eternal death, which is permanent separation from God. By the way, there's nothing in between. My, my, my niece, uh, Lauren, she, we were at her place, uh, was it just yesterday? Yeah, yesterday, and she was asking, hey, can you help me uh, witness uh, to my Catholic family members and so forth? And she asked, what's the difference between what Catholics believe and what Christians believe? And by the way, Catholics do not believe the same thing that we believe about the Bible. And one of the things that they teach is that there's a place called purgatory. There's no such place called purgatory. There's no middle ground to where a person, when they die, and they have yet to be determined whether they've earned enough good works or enough merit or have done enough sacraments that, according to their scripture that, that would earn them a place or a spot in heaven. And, and if not, uh, they're going to go to purgatory and their family who are still alive on earth can pray or give money to the church or light a candle uh, to, to hopefully earn merit on behalf of their family who's in purgatory. Listen, that's heresy. That's not in the Bible. When you think about eternal separation, eternal separation is real. The Bible teaches us. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the Bible teaches us for the wages of sin is death, eternal separation. Now, if, you, if you've been attending our church services for a while, or this is your first time, and you haven't placed your complete faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible teaches us that if you die a, a, apart from God, and if you die without Jesus Christ, your Savior, you're not going to go to eternal life. You're going to go to eternal separation. But God doesn't want you to go there. So he offers eternal hope and eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. And he mentions heaven that can be reserved for us. 
I want to talk about heaven for a few minutes here. Heaven, notice this, is an, un, uh, is, uh, an incorruptible inheritance. In chapter 1, verse 4, it says, To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. First thing I want to mention regarding heaven as our incorruptible inheritance is that heaven is a real place. Heaven's not just a figure of our imagination or uh, some, some fantasy that believers wrote uh, in the New Testament. No, heaven's a real place. Jesus talks about heaven. The Bible speaks about the three heavens. There's the atmospheric heaven, which is the first heaven. Secondly, there's the celestial heaven. But what God speaks about here is the third heaven or the eternal heaven, God's abode or place where God dwells. And if you study the Gospels, Jesus taught much about heaven. In Matthew 16, for example, the Bible teaches us that Jesus said, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal. Listen, heaven's a real place. The Apostle Paul, if you study his writing, and the Apostle John in his writing talks about their visions of heaven. Heaven's a real place. Heaven is remarkable. You know, ever since the pandemic and crime rates and the DA in San Francisco uh, 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 came into power and position, San Francisco has become one of the most detested places to visit. <laughs> it wasn't always like that. Tourism was big in San Francisco. Not anymore. You walk the streets and there's needle drugs and other things. Listen, in heaven, there's no trash in heaven. Heaven's a beautiful place. Incomparable to anything that our eyes have witnessed here on earth. The city of God with streets of gold, gates of pearl and walls of jasper, the river and the sea like crystal. But much more than what we can see and, 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 and what we have given to us in Scripture, the most important thing of why heaven is remarkable is the very presence of God. Our human mind can't even begin to imagine how, what, what it would be like to step foot into eternity in heaven and, the, and seeing the best part, which is not a what, it's a who, it's seeing God's glory. Heaven's remarkable because God's glory radiates throughout the ends of, the, uh, of, of heaven and, and we will be lost in his awe and in his beauty and in his greatness. Heaven's remarkable because of who God is and we get to see his glory. The sound of worship towards God will ring loud and all the saints are gathered around him to praise his name. The angels are gathered to exalt him. The glory of God will be exalted and he'll be magnified on the throne. Listen, heaven is a remarkable place. Heaven's a reunion. I think all of us have heard, if not most of us, have heard about our dear brother, Brother Rich, who's in heaven now. I remember we were just packing his stuff for him and Mrs. Hayes, and, and he had a lot of stuff. <laughs> they, they, like, rented out this uh, first storage, and they had to get another one, and then after that, we still need to get a third one. I know it was just a joy being around them and just the, the joy that they have. And I was looking at some of their pictures. He served in the Air Force and gave his life to our country. But more importantly, he was a Christian and he, had, he left a great legacy for God. We're going to see him someday. And if you've lost a loved one who was saved, listen, brothers and sisters in Christ, there's a time coming where you'll be reunited. If your loved one that's gone before you was saved and has placed their faith in Jesus Christ, and if you're saved, you're going to see them again someday. Heaven is a reunion. I like this. Heaven is rest. No more pain. No more sicknesses. No more suffering. No more tears. And more importantly, no more death. John in his Writing in Revelation, said, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. If you're battling with cancer, cancer doesn't make it to heaven, amen? If you have some 
form of arthritis or some form of uh, a, a problem with your body, listen, all of that's going to go away. Heaven is going to be a place of rest for you. In heaven, those that have suffered loss will find comfort. Those that were persecuted uh, for their faith will find refuge in God. Those that have labored for his work and have longed for his coming will be rewarded. Those that are in Christ will find eternal rest in heaven. This world is not our home. Some of you are holding on to this world too tightly. Some of you are too invested in this world. Some of you care too much about the things of this world. Listen, brothers and sisters in Christ, this world is not our home. We're just a passing through. Our home is way beyond the blue, amen? Our home is in heaven. We are citizens of heaven. Heaven is an incorruptible inheritance. But let her be, we see that heaven has an inclusive invitation. In verse 3, of our passage, it says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a lively hope. There's a word in that verse, verse number three, that indicates an invitation. And that word is mercy. Aren't you thankful for God's mercy? Mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. Mercy is God's second chance. The Bible describes God's mercy as abundant mercy. The Bible teaches us a God who is rich in mercy. The Bible teaches us a God who delights in mercy. Listen, we have a merciful God this morning. And God's mercy is calling unto you. It's inviting you to take his promise of eternal life and salvation. You see, God gives us this gift of mercy. But like any gift, faith must be exercised by the recipient in order to receive and obtain and enjoy that gift. Just because God sent Jesus Christ to die for our sins and just because Jesus rose from the dead for you and just because God desires for you to go to heaven after this life does not automatically mean that you're going to heaven. God wants you to be saved and God wants you to go to heaven. But listen, the choice is really up to you. Ephesians chapter 2, the Bible says in verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved. In verse 8, the Bible says, For by grace are ye saved. Notice this, through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Mercy is extending God's gift to you. And the gift of eternal life. That gift of hope, that gift of salvation. I want to I wanna just talk to those maybe in this room. If you're not 100% sure you're going to heaven, this gift's for you. If you're watching by live stream, it doesn't matter where you are, whether you're in America or somebody else, if you've never trusted Christ as, a savior, as, as, for your, for, as your Savior, God is asking you to accept this gift of eternal life. Why? Because you can't get to heaven on your own good works. You're not saved because you are a good person. You're not saved because you uh, uh, attended some church or you are not saved because you trusted in a pope or a pastor. You're not saved because of anything that you've ever done. Listen, you're only saved through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Titus chapter 3, the Bible says, not of works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which, was, uh, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You need God's mercy to save you. You see, before you can have eternal life, you must admit that you're a sinner. You can't get saved if you understand that if you don't understand that you're a sinner who needs to be saved. You must admit that according to God, you've fallen short of his standard. You've fallen short of his glory and your sin separates you from God. And as a sinner, secondly, not only must you admit that you're a sinner, you must acknowledge that salvation is through the, only through the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You must ask Jesus Christ to forgive you and to save you from all your sins. You say, Brother Irwin, that's it? That's it. Salvation is not complicated. Salvation is, is not hard to obtain. You must completely faith, uh, put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and ask him to save you because you're a sinner who needs to be forgiven. And what I love about this is once you've trusted Christ as your Savior, 
and you've obtained salvation and you've obtained eternal life and you have that hope of God, the Bible says you can never lose it. You can never lose your salvation. Our hope, our salvation in God is eternal. I was reading a book that Dr. Getch wrote and he made mention of a time that he was preaching at a church that were primary immigrants from, uh, that consisted primarily of immigrants from Russia. And the pastor that he was with, that, was, uh, he, that he was preaching for, was trying to explain to him that in Russia, since they've experienced so much uh, of the government taking from them, they really have a weak co concept of eternal security. They can't comprehend something that would last forever. So when Dr. Getch preached on eternal security, their hearts, you could just sense that their hearts were being encouraged. Their eyes are glazing with hope. That when God says that you're saved and you're saved forever, he means it. Now, I don't know what you're trusting in this morning. I don't know where your joy is. I don't know where your hope is resting. I don't know where you're trying to find peace. But if it's not God, it's not going to last forever. Hope that lasts forever is what God wants us to have. So here we see our source of hope is Jesus Christ, our solid rock, our security in heaven. It's an incorruptible place. It's a real and it's a remarkable place that God wants us to experience and to have uh, 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 secured for us. And God is extending his mercy to us. But lastly this morning, as we're studying this subject of a living or a lively hope, I want to talk about our strength and hardship. You see, hope is not just a concept that we have for our future. Hope is very relative and practical for us believers today. And I want to say this too, how appropriate for the Holy Spirit to choose the Apostle Peter to address the subject of hope. Not only because hope is important, but you can see that in the life of the Apostle Peter, Peter needed hope. And I think if there's a disciple or an apostle that Lord Jesus Christ was, uh, had called to follow him, I think most of us can relate to Peter, amen? I mean, Peter, of course, he was a servant that was used of God greatly, but if you study his life, uh, Peter made a lot of mistakes. How many of you guys have made a lot of mistakes? Uh, Peter had times where his faith wasn't strong. How many of you guys would like to admit that your faith isn't always strong? And listen, God chose, and he knew this. God knew that Peter was the right person to write on this living hope. You know why? Because hope was real to him. Hope was real to him. And brothers and sisters in Christ, you and I can have this living hope, not just for a distant uh, future that we can uh, uh, gain in promise, but we can have hope that can give us strength and power and motivation and, and, and allow us to move forward in times of hardship. You see, it was Peter who was rebuked for his sword. It was Peter who betrayed the Lord Jesus thrice. It was Peter who left the ministry after God had told him to preach. He said, I, I, I'm not going to preach. I go back a fishing. Oh, but God's hope kept working in his life. Remember, it was Peter who was uh, threatened for preaching the gospel in the book of Acts. It was Peter who was thrown in prison after Herod uh, beheaded James. It was Peter who received a prophecy from the Lord Jesus Christ that he would die a death of crucifixion. But you know what kept Peter going? especially in times of hardship, hope. Our hope is not limited to just some future security. Our hope is relevant for us today. And I want to show you how first hope gives us a future disposition. If you would take again your Bibles, chapter number one of 1 Peter. We read this, but I'll read it again. In verse number six, the Bible says, wherein, because you understand the security of God's hope in your life, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season. If need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen, ye love, and whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. You see, God tells us that there's purpose 
and reason for the trials that we have to face. Hope gives us a future disposition. We are understanding that whatever trial or hardship that I'm facing right now is ultimately for, for God's glory, but also for my good. God is using this trial of faith so that when I am presented to the Lord, I will be like precious gold, presentable to him. Those who are familiar with metal work understand that fire is used to reveal the impurities of metal. And once the metal has been liquefied through fire, the impurities or the dross will rise to the top, making it easier to remove. The less dross inside means the more pure the metal becomes. And the more pure a metal is will indicate the value of that metal. And if you study this, metal in its purest form is almost transparent. You see, metal has to be melted with fire in order to be purified. Brothers and sisters in Christ, your fiery trials are not in vain. God doesn't give it to you. God doesn't entrust you with that trial because he is inconsiderate of you and your feelings. And it's not because God is just throwing something your way without purpose. No, God has a purpose for your trial. You can trust him. That whatever hardship he's allowing you to endure for a season is for the purpose of purifying you and purifying your life so that you will be more presentable to him when you see him face to face. Hope gives us a future disposition. You don't have to get bitter in your trial. You don't have to worry in your trial. You don't have to give up in your trial. God is carefully working with his uh, merciful hand to help carry you through that trial. There's a future disposition. But also, letter B, hope gives us a focused dependence. That in our hardship, it reminds us to rely on God more. That in times of trials and temptations and hardship, our strength, though it, be may we, be, though it may be weak, our strength, though it may fail, can be renewed by the strength of God. It teaches us that our strength comes from God, amen? And just like as Jesus stood... As the fourth man in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and just as he stood with those men thrown in the fire, listen, Jesus stands with you in your fire. Jesus can give you strength to endure. Jesus can give you strength to be strong and to stand fast for your faith in the Lord. Jesus can help you uh, 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 lift you up in times when you've been thrown down. Psalms 31, verse 24, the Bible says, Be of good courage. He shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. Lamentations chapter 3, the Bible says in verse 21 and following this, I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Hey, listen, great is thy faithfulness, the Bible says. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul, therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Listen, hope it's not just some future promise that we claim. Hope is real right now. God's hope teaches us that our dependence should be on him. And then lastly, hope gives us a firm devotion. He says in verse number 8, Whom having not seen, ye love. In whom though now you see him not, the Bible says, yet believing. Why do we continue to endure? Why do we continue to run our race and why do we continue to climb forth onto higher ground well it's because of a firm devotion our love for god hope helps hope reminds us that our reason the reason why we continue to serve god despite of hardship is because of our love for him the author of hebrew wrote this in hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 looking unto jesus the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of god for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself lest you be wearied and faint in your minds hope is real hope is needed for us as believers to continue walking this 
walk that we have in our Lord and this, this Christian faith, it, it, is, it is needed. Hope is needed to keep us moving forward in our faith in the Lord. There's a hymn writer by the name of Edward Mote. Edward Mote was born in a poor and uh, uh, ungodly family in London, England. In his youth, he said, and he was giving a testimony in writing, he said, my Sundays were spent on the streets. So ignorant was I that I did not know that there was even a God. So in his youth, he was very distant. He grew in a family of unbelievers. He grew up in a family of unbelievers, and, and he, he had no concept, no desire to know who God is. Until when he was 16, he took an apprentice job to be a carpenter, primarily working as a cabinet maker. And his boss, his employer, was a Christian. And one of the things that he would often do is he would take Edward Mote to go hear preachers. And at one point, there was a time where Edward Mote and his uh, uh, employer listened to the gospel preacher there in England by the name of John Hyatt. In the time that he heard John Hyatt preach the gospel, his heart was greatly convicted of his sin and his need for the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that service, Edward Mote trusted Christ as his Savior and was gloriously converted. His life changed. Through his teen years and his young adult life, he continued to grow in his faith, and he kept on growing closer and closer and closer to the Lord. There was a time when he was walking to work, and he was so impressed in his heart to write a hymn, and he, he has a testimony in writing regarding this. He said, I was walking and thinking of writing a hymn about the glorious experiences of Christians. By the time that he got to work, he had the first two phrases that was used in the chorus for the song, which reads, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. While he was working that day, the Holy Spirit just kept on impressing in his heart to think of the words that would complete this song, this hymn. And so he was able to think of the words and complete the song with the first and the second and the third stanzas. To his surprise, after work, he was invited by a friend who was actually a preacher to go visit his wife who was sick. There at that moment, they were trying to give encouragement to this sick woman, and uh, they were trying to pray over her and just asking God for his mercies to heal her body. And before they were to depart, uh, Edward Mote and this preacher friend, they said, hey, why don't we sing a song? And his preacher friend was trying to look around the house and trying to find in the shelves a hymnal, a, a songbook that he can use to sing some songs before they leave. And he couldn't find any. And then Edward Mote remembered that in his pocket was a piece of paper. He pulled it out and it was the hymn that we know today as the solid rock. It reads, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ, my righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Second sentence says, his oath, his covenant, his blood. Support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. Where is your hope this morning? If you're not saved, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, Friend, I encourage you, don't leave today without hope. God wants you to have his hope by placing your faith in Jesus Christ alone. And brothers and sisters in Christ, if you're going through some hardship, if you're going through trials, let me remind you, hope is not some, just some distant promise to claim. Hope can be real right now for you. Our hope is in Jesus, amen. A living hope. Let's pray, shall we?